Good morning, everybody. Just, let's stand and start off giving the Lord a hand clap of praise. Well, as I travel through this pilgrim land, there's a friend who walks with me. Oh, he leads me safely through that sinking sand. It's the Christ.
left the 99 and came for me. Uh, one day I made a choice. I came back home. And a few years ago, I ran into this gentleman at work. We had the same occupation, but we worked for different companies. He was all about Jesus. I was all about living for the world. And he would uh, inject every now and then Jesus, his walk, you know. I don't know what he's talking about. And Lord, forgive me, I was giving him a hard time. I was. But one day, I made a choice. And I called that man up. And I said, I came home. Thank you. You don't think it makes a difference when you share Christ, when you live what you say you serve. It makes a difference. So be aware, whoever you're around, be aware that you need to share. Because if we're in here lifting up his holy name, Oh, there's somebody watching. I was watching. Tiger Knight, the, the, the man. But because of his blood, it's okay. You see, my slave is clean now. His mercy covers me every morning, Roy. Oh, we're so blessed. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for the prayers that are being answered. Father, we thank you, Lord, for prayers that's going to be answered. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you bless this offering, Lord. Bless the ones that have to give the further your kingdom, Father, in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you, and amen.
I'm going this morning, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22. How many of y'all know that every word recorded in the Bible is important? Y'all going to help me this morning. You're going to just. I said every word is important. And you can glean from it. It's like uh, going to a threshing floor and just gleaning the good out of it. You can read a text ten times and never come to the end of that text. Because it's a well. It's a, it's a, it's a gold mine. My pastor used to say you can mine nuggets out of it. And uh, it never gets old. I'm going to preach a very serious sermon this morning. And uh, I want you to hear me. And I want our board to hear me. I want our people to hear me. Because I believe God's taken this church somewhere. In fact... Uh, Brother Josh, will you do me a favor and just run back there and tell the deacons I want them to come on out right now. They'll count, they can count money anytime. Tell them, tell them I want them to come out here. There they come. Hey, Brother Randy, get them other guys. Just tell them I want them to come on out. How many knows we're a body of Christ? So I want them. I want, I want to, uh, I want our board to hear me this morning. I, I want to, I want our church to hear my heart. I believe God's taken this church somewhere. I believe it's stronger today than I've ever believed it in 32 years. I believe the prophecy that is has been spoken over this church will come to pass, and you can make up a choice. You get involved 
or not. It's going to happen with or without you. I choose to be involved. I, I, I've been preaching tough, tough sermons lately. I, I know I have. But my God, if we was ever in a time where the church needs to be challenged. Challenged to be everything we can be. Challenged to have desire. Challenged to fall in love with him again. And when you fall in love with him, you fall in love with his church. If we've ever been in a time where we need to put things on the back burner. Somebody's catching this vision. And I'll tell you why. Uh, this morning we came in and Sister Ivy came up to me and handed me a, 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 a note that said we've had this much more given to missions this morning. Thank God for three more thousand that went in missions program this morning. Somebody's going to catch this vision of what God wants to do. And so, <clears throat> we're going to the book of Ezekiel this morning, and I'm preaching this morning to me and to you. I'm preaching to every individual in this church, so don't shovel it over your shoulder. Take it. I'm preaching to us. We're going to move up as a church. Ezekiel 22, verse number 30. This is God talking. He says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And the saddest words in your Bible says, but I found none. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none you can be seated in the house of the Lord this morning from the very dawn of time men would come to a place of walking with the Lord and then draw back they had times of revival the Bible would record that there was times of renewal you would see men from Adam all the way back to Adam's walk that he would walk with the Lord. The Bible said concerning Adam, he walked with the voice of the Lord God in the cool of the evening to the question that fell from the lips of the Lord, Adam, where art thou? There was a day when Adam walked with God. They were in unity. They were in fellowship. They were in an intimate relationship as far as spiritually it goes, to the place where just a few days later you find Adam hiding among the bushes and God happened to call out with a voice in the garden, Adam, where are you? Where did you go? Notice this morning that it was not God that moved, it was Adam that moved. The Bible would tell us of men that have fallen back. There was times of renewal. There was times of revival. But men would also, after those times of renewal and revival, they would become complacent. They would become stagnant. They would wander back, step one inch away from God. Can I remind you this morning that backsliding is not you quitting church and going to the house. Backsliding away from God is for you to step one step back when it comes to desire. One step back when it comes to your love. One step back when it comes to your fire that burns within you. You can take one step back and you are backslidden. It doesn't doesn't take us condemning the man or the woman that doesn't come to church any longer. Some of us sit on pews this morning and we are so far removed from God because our desire is not there. We don't love the things of God like we used to love the things of God. Our calling, our job, our ministry means nothing more to us than a title anymore. May I say to you this morning and, and, and hopefully convict everybody in this building that living for God is a progressive uphill
your walk with God to one day you are saved and you begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I ask you this morning, how long has it been since you have grown? You can blame it on the preacher, blame it on the church, blame it on whoever you want to, but that Bible tells me this morning that every single time men or women of God would draw back into perdition, draw back into a falling away, every time they would leave the walk with God, it was only them that they could blame. The blame fell on the shoulders of every individual. May I remind you when Samson walked with God, the Bible said he could destroy lions with his bare hands. There was times when the Spirit of God would come upon him so strong. I feel the Lord on me right now. And the Spirit of God would come upon him so strong that he rip up the eight gates of Gaza, carry them to the top of the mountain and set them down. Get 300 foxes and catch them by his own hand. Tie the five brands in their tails and destroy the, 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 the enemy's fields. And can I share with you this morning, all of us go through those times when we feel the Lord is on our side and we're close to God and we're feeling the winds of revival. But I want to ask you this morning, how far are you away from God? If God this morning was looking for a man to stand in the gap, a man that would make up the hedge, somebody that would stand in the place and say the devil's not coming any further. If there was anybody that God was looking for this morning, from the dawn of time, Brother Terry, with that first man, Adam, God was looking for a man. And may I say to you this day, August the 1st, 2021. God's not changed his plan. He's looking for a man, somebody, anybody that would stand in the gap, that would love him enough to get up out of a backslid place, get up out of a place of no desire, get up out of a place of return love, and step up in the gap again and say, I'm going to make up the hedge of the Lord. The enemy can come no further. There's a devil loose to destroy that world out there. Somebody's got to reach them for the cause of Christ. May it be me. I'm crying tonight. May it be you. May we have the zeal of God on our life to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Or, or are you just in this thing for the blessing? When you look into the history of Israel, there were times of great revivals, great moves of God that changed people and cities and nations. Yet every time the people would draw back, and every time the people would draw back, the Lord would send them into times of great trials and bondages. If you're sitting here this morning say, man, I've really been going through some stuff. It's time for you to examine your own self. Listen, honey, every time that men drew back and lost desire and lost the fire of the Lord, God would send them into bondage. He would cause great trials to come upon them to shake them and to wake them up so that they return to God. And yes, this morning, you said, preacher, I don't know if I can come out of this place where I'm at. I'm telling you that God's will is for you to be in revival. God's will is for you to be renewed in the Spirit. God's will is for the Holy, Holy Ghost to fall on you and to stay on you. God's will is for you to rise in the morning with praise on your lips and go to bed at night with praise on your lips. God's will is for the fire of the Holy Ghost to be on the Lord's satire. I said God's will is for the Holy Ghost to burn in you so deep. But maybe that's not our will. Maybe we've come to a place where we're just laxed. Every time those people would draw back, God sent them into times of trials and bondages. Listen to me this morning, 40 years in the wilderness. That they Babylonian captivity. 
They didn't have to go there. They chose it. Roman oppression at the time of Jesus, they didn't have to go there. But they chose it. And every single time that God sent them into great bondage, they looked religious. But their heart was removed from God. Hear what I'm telling you this morning. Even at the time of Christ, do you know why Christ hung out with sinners, hung out with prostitutes, hung out with blind, touched the leper? Do you know why he went to dead man's tombs and raised them from the dead? Because it was easier to raise somebody that was mortally dead than it was to raise a church that was spiritually dead. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you, he done greater work in the graveyard of humanity than he can get his people to move. They had the robes on. They had scripture in their head. They looked like a church, but they were full of dead man's bones, twice removed, dead, plucked up by the roots. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? They stood in the temple. They came to church. They sung the song. They went through the routine. They went through the ritual. But deep down in God's heart, He knew this is a people removed from me. They're still they're hard hearted they're hard faced they don't feel the move of God my friend they had come to a place when God showed up they didn't even know it was him I wonder this morning what's it going to take to move you and I out of the place where we are right now what's it going to take to get our desire back What's it going to take for our calling, our ministry, to be more than just a title? Amen. In fact, the book would tell us, listen to this, the Bible would tell us that from Exodus 14 to the book of Numbers 14, the Bible tells us of ten different times that the Lord drawn his, had drawn his people to him to try to prove himself only for them to turn and draw away from him. It's not a question of the blessing of God. You look around this room, there's testimony after testimony of how God has been good to you. But somebody can dawn this pulpit and say, isn't God good? And three people will say, that's right. Because there's no excitement and God being good to us anymore. We get secondary. He's been so good that we expect him to do it. He's a slave to us. Are you hearing me? We expect him to serve us when we think we need to be served. And we, come on somebody, you know I'm, I, I'm here. We expect to come to church and feel the blessing of God and to walk out of here and say I was glad to go to church. It's not a question of what God does for us. It is a question of, uh, of what we are doing for God. Are we so lazy? Are we so slanderous? Are we so uh, are we so drawn into ourselves? Are we too busy to serve God? Can I ask the question this morning? Are we too busy to love Him like we loved Him when He first saved us? What if He took that salvation away? What if He took that joy away? What if He took that eternal life away? Would you get on the altar then? Would you beg him then? Would you seek the Lord again then? Would you go to work for him then? It's not a question of his blessing. This is not going anywhere like I thought it would be. He clothed them. He led them. He gave them water. He dropped manna and quail from heaven to them. All they had to do was pick it up. It was already ready. You, you ain't helping me. He, call, he loved them so much that he caused a cloud to follow them by day to block the sun rays so they wouldn't get too hot in that wilderness. He, he caused the fire to hover over them. Come on, somebody. Uh, why, uh, during the night while they slept so that the fire of God would keep 
them warm and they wouldn't get cold on those desert nights. And yet after all that he'd done, they rebelled, the Bible said, and drew back into perdition. They fell away from the things of God. Somebody sent me something this week that said this might be the great falling away. I'm going to tell you, honey, it ain't a fall away of numbers. No, sir. The church is bigger than we've ever been. We got more people in church than there's ever been around the world. The great falling away is not people. The great falling away is there will be a falling away of desire. There'll be a falling away from the truth of the word of God. There'll be a falling away in our love for the Lamb of God. There'll be a great falling away of us taking a necessity and seeing the seriousness of us doing our job and being what the church wants to be. I'm praying from this pulpit and I'm declaring it under a prophetic word that this thing's going to change from this pulpit to that back door. I pray for desire to come in this building. I usher in the Holy Ghost. I summon the power of God to rest in this church until it wakes us up, fires us up, and gives us a good dose of the Holy Ghost of God again. I was sitting in my house the other day. I was minding my own business. I was sitting on my couch watching MASH. I don't have, I don't have TV, I don't have, you know, cable or anything, dish or nothing. All I got is DVDs. And my favorite sitcom is MASH. And uh, so I was watching MASH. And I picked up my phone and I was scrolling through YouTube and I come across this video of a Baptist church. I thought, well, I ain't no sense of watching that. Because, you know, we get high minded. We're more spiritual because we're Pentecostal. Are you? Spiritual is not emotion, spiritual is doing what God's called you to do. I got to, I, I felt like the Lord said, scroll back down and watch that. It was a singing group. I scrolled back down and I hit the button. And I'm sitting there. And these two, this man and two women got up to sing. And this church was having some type of meeting. I don't know what it was. But the pastor said, I want them to come and sing before the preacher preaches. They get up and start singing. I can't take heart that's broken make it over again oh but I I know a man who can man when they sung that I mean when they hit that right there the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said I could do it again he said I could do it again if you can get them to believe, I can do it again. For whatsoever things a man can believe, he can have. Come on, somebody. If we say we're Pentecostal, we say we're full of the Holy Ghost, we say we've got the gifts of the Spirit, why don't we sit here twice dead and plucked up by the roots? Why is our desire gone? Where's our love gone? If he can do it again, I pray he does it. I'm going to tell you what happened. I got about halfway through that song. I found myself down between my coffee table and my, and my sofa. I was laid prostrate on the floor. I, I wet that carpet about that big with, a, with tears dropping off of my face. I felt the Holy Ghost all over me. I laid in that floor and rolled like a holy roller. I rolled from one side to the other. The power of God was on me. I spoke in tongues. I prayed for I don't know how long. When I come up out of there, I heard the Lord say, send that video to Andy Lynn. I sent it to Andy Lynn. In about 10 minutes, Andy Lynn called me. He said, my God, I just had hip surgery and I feel like running. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm telling you that when you got a desire, God said, I'll feel it. You want the desires of your heart. God said, I'll give you the desire of your heart. It don't mean you get what 
what you want. It means if you open up your heart, God will put desire there. I'm preaching better than what I was going to preach. Listen, listen to why we don't. Listen to why we don't have what God wants us to have. After all he done for them, the Bible said they rebelled and they drew back. Listen to this. I read the scripture last night about two o'clock in the morning. The Bible said they raged against God. They were mad at him. How in the world can you sit in church and be mad at God? They complained. They didn't focus on what he gave them. They focused on what he was withholding from them. And the very things he was withholding from them, he knew they didn't need to fulfill what he had called them to be. They rebelled, the Bible said. They refused, listen to this, they refused God's report concerning the land of Canaan. They made a golden calf for the purpose of replacing the God that brought them out of bondage. Idols. How many of them you got? What's your idol now? Can't come to church because of a job? So money's your God. Taking on extra hours, but missing church, money should die. I told you I'm going to preach conviction into this house. This would have been all right 50 years ago. Depending on that job to be the supplier when God said, I'm your supplier. What are, what are we doing? What are we teaching the next generation that comes after us? That the love of money is the root of all evil? Well, I got a supply for my family, preacher. No, you got to feed them. You don't have to drive a $50,000 vehicle. You don't have to live in a house you can't afford. You don't have to have credit cards that you need to pay off. Come on, son. I'm here. You, you. Your kids ain't got to wear $400 shoes. No, sir, they need to come down and be brought down a level. Come on, somebody. You need to teach them the humbleness before the Lord. It's right in the sight of God. Are you hearing me? Worst thing you can do with the kids, give them everything they want. They turn out to be a brat, a sport brat. What are you teaching them? Do good in this world. Come on, do good in this world. Get you a house, cars, toys, build up a bank account. But now remember, we believe the Lord's soon coming. If he is, what are you building a house for? Why cars? Why bank accounts? Why? Why? Why do you want to get them so settled into this world that they become captive to it? In bondage, chasing the same thing you're chasing. What if they fall out of love with you? Yeah, after all that God done for them, the Lord drew them. He, he loved them. He tried to pull them to his side. He walked through their camps searching for a man. He tried individuals down through the time, down through time. In fact, he chose certain tribes. Can I find a man in the tribe of Levi? What about the tribe of Judah? Maybe not, but could I try the tribe of Dan? What about the tribe of Manasseh? And God searched every tribe for one man and found none. He tried Abraham and Abraham was a liar. He tried Noah, he was a drunk. He tried. 
Maybe, maybe, maybe I could, maybe I could have put, put judges in place and anoint those judges. But those judges failed. Can I go somewhere without offending anybody? He tried men. I'll put men judges in place. And they failed. Samson was a judge. They failed. So then he flipped and tried a woman. And put her in as a judge. Lord help me to stay all right. Couldn't find anybody. I'll anoint prophet, prophets. I'll get me some prophets. Those, those that speak the prophetic word. But those prophets died angry. Read it. It's in the book. I'll try priest. I'll stick priest on the throne of Israel. And Israel will be guided by a spiritual father. He'll be the intercessor between me and them. But you know what the Bible says about the Eli the priest? He got facts set on the throne of Israel. You know what that means? Once he got to the throne, he stopped doing anything. He sat long enough just to get a lot of weight out of him. He quit paying attention to what was going on in the church. And his two sons that was in training, Hophni and Phinehas, they were having adulterous affairs on the altar. But Eli didn't know. And if he did know, he didn't care. Because he blinded himself to the condition of the church. And when they came and told him, not, not told him that Phineas and Hannah, Hannah, whatever his name is, and Phineas, not when they told him that he was, they were committing affairs on the altar, that didn't, that, didn't, that didn't derange him at all. But when they came to him and said, God has, has wrote Ichabod above the door of the house of God, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. Eli knew, I've sat here too long. I've had no desire too long. My passion for God's been gone too long. And now I can't do nothing about it. And the Bible said he fell backwards off of his throne and broke his neck and died. Tribe. Tribes, judges, priests, prophets. I can't find a man. So here's what I'll do. I'll give them pastors. I'll give a men of God that lives daily with the sheep, shepherds. Pastors that live daily with the sheep. They will lead the sheep into green pastures and beside still waters. And they'll finally be what I've called them to be. But those shepherds found out that sheep go astray. They have a tendency to leave the sheepfold. Shepherds found out that it's not as easy as it is to lead sheep to green pastures and besides the waters because sometimes they don't want to be led. So the Bible said, woe unto the pastor. He found out that pastors in Jeremiah 23 scattered the sheep because they had a heart. And this is where we're at in ministry today. The, he found that God found out that the pastors had a heart for themselves, not for the sheep. The shepherd wanted to be paid. He wanted to be fed. He wanted to be took care of. 
He didn't care about the sheep. Y'all done all that. Y'all bored yet? I'm fixing clothes. He done all of that. With one thought in mind. I want to find one man that'll stand in the gap, that'll make up the hedge. One man. Becca, will you come here? You and your two boys. You and your two boys come here. Don't you go over just right over there and stand. You, you stand. One man. Come here, red Come on, hurry. I got two minutes for this sermon. I'm, I'm going to use Terry to prove a point. Preacher, right? Transitions happen. They're, they're, they're about to get married. I can't hardly say the word. It makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're about to get married. And, and I, know, I know you've been thought pattern toward that. Preparing for all that. How big's the house got to be to Take it all in. How? What do I got to do now as a husband, bro? I know how you think. You can gain all that. Right? I think she's been a godsend to you. But you can gain that. You can gain two more stepsons. Or two stepsons. Good boys. I want his hair. I'm going to have it before long. Two, two good boys. You can gain two good stepsons. Ain't, ain't two better boys in the world. Remember I said that. But if you miss, you get centered around in this and you don't take time to pray, to study, to preach, to make the thing, the number one thing God's called you to do. If a man, this is words in red, if a man can't hate his father and his mother, they don't, that doesn't mean despise, like hate, like we feel. If a man can't love me more than he loves his father and his mother, his family, his sons, his wife. He cannot be my disciple. Your call is, to not, is not to be a husband. Your call is not to be a father figure. Your call is to be a man of God. You're going to transition. And I'm going to lay some heavy weight on you. Rebecca, if he succeeds as a man of God, it'll be you that supports it. If he fails as a man of God, it'll lay on your shoulders. How do you get that, preacher? And the twine became one. When they say, I do, and they get married, they are no longer two. 
You two are no longer just hers. You two are no longer just his. You're one family. And I'm going to tell you something. You hear me? You're getting a good man for a step back. A good man. You hear me? You're getting a good woman for a stepmother. Now, Terry, what's he going to do for the Lord? You know what God done? I was thinking about this yesterday. All God done was took three and doubled your blessing. He doubled your blessing because you've been faithful, but listen to me. What you do from that day forward with this lays on you. Because God ain't looking for a woman. Ezekiel 33, 20 said, I'm searching for a man that'll stand in the gap and make up the hedge. I'm looking for a man that'll love me enough to step up and say, the devil ain't coming no further. place where this means more than that out there. Come here, man. She texted me this morning for prayer clocks right there. They are. They ain't gonna be no more anointed than that. How's in the flow this morning, man? You, you can be seated. I, I just... Are y'all hearing me? I'm going to close. Randy, what about it? Willing to be the man? David? Be the man, ain't you? Josh? Willing to be a man? Willing to be a man? If you're going to be a man, you got to put away childish things. If this church is going to be, I could read to you from the book of, of, uh, of uh, what's that book we're studying in? Ephesians. I, I could read to you from the book of Ephesians that God is creating us to be the man Christ Jesus in the earthly realm. We're supposed to be in the fullness of the statue of the man Christ Jesus. But in order for this church to do that, we've got to get rid of childish, immature things. I'm done. Come on. You can just play something. We don't have to. I, I'm gonna. I'm letting them take that message home and think about it. I'm gonna preach a double header tonight. Let's stand all over this building.
close the service out. Thanks to God. some fun and educating uh, some sessions for our team, girls, boys, between 8 and 12, okay? In order for us to do that, you're going to have to bring them, amen? 8 and 12, Loretta and Miss Giggles, Miss Amber, <laughs> is going to be the leaders over the girls and meeting the fellowship hall. Tyler and Sean, Sean's not with us. We'll lead the boys and meet upstairs in the youth room. Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, let's get an offering plate. We'll pass it. We'll pass it around. We'll get in here and sing a song. 
Y'all want me to sing? <laughs> God said he would turn it around. 